Welcome to Run With It, the podcast that brings you business ideas from established entrepreneurs. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guests would take to get started. Follow through and you can earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Here are your hosts, Chris Justin and Ethan Janney. I'm Chris Justin. And I'm Ethan Janney. And on today's show, we have Erin Hooley. She's president and founder of Bailey's Blossoms, a brand that reimagines infant and toddler fashion. She also founded Peyton Bree, a clothing company for tweens and teens with a call to empower young girls to feel confident and beautiful. Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. We are very excited to have you. We uh, have been looking forward to this interview for quite some time, so glad we could make it work here. Very impressive what you've been able to do with with, uh, your family and multiple brands. You've got a podcast now. We'll talk about all of that throughout the interview, but the crux of this interview and the idea behind the podcast in general is to bring ideas from successful entrepreneurs like yourself to our listeners and share not only the idea, but how you think about business problems and how you would get started on the action steps. So that's what we're going to dive into. We'll save some time at the end to talk a lot about Bailey's Blossoms and Peyton Bree and your podcast. But let's kick things off by asking you to tell us about an idea that you would like our listeners to run with. Absolutely. So right now we're in the middle of COVID-19. It's a big old hot mess out there. And I think one of the things that I've seen the most in working with the wholesale industry and the retail industry and seeing how many people are just completely struggling and even shutting down and panicking because they don't know how to pivot and turn. And what I see in front of us is just this great opportunity. And it's an opportunity to adapt and an opportunity to change. And when it takes a really big life event, usually a birth, a death, a job loss, something to shake us up and allow us to be open and susceptible to considering change. I'm looking at all of these agencies that run Facebook ads and they've got all their eggs in this one basket saying, this is the recipe for success. But the reality is that you're banking on someone else's business platform. Mark Zuckerberg could pull the plug or change an algorithm or do something that is going to put the majority of your business in jeopardy if you are banking on that and that alone. So here I'm looking at all these agencies, all these, all of this opportunity for people to step back and take ownership of as many channels of responsibility as you possibly can. Are there any agencies out there that fully understand what it takes to run a successful e-commerce business? And so I have these three levers that we use to be able to drive that traffic and increase our sales that have actually given us an 80% increase in sales over COVID-19 since the onset of it back in late March. But ultimately, I just look at this huge opportunity for somebody to step in and fill in this gap where it's not just Facebook driven, but it is e-commerce driven as a whole. Absolutely. So the crux of it is there are a ton of businesses out there who have not been able to transition swiftly or, or well to an online based economy. And you have through uh, trial by fire, figured out a, a system that works really well that you own. And there's an opportunity for people out there to take a system like that and apply it to, to businesses who have not been able to make that transition as well as you have. Yes, absolutely. Sounds great. And also, I'm, I'm catching what you're saying about Facebook. You know, we're killers at Facebook ads. And uh, look at what happened to people who did Amazon affiliate marketing, right? Yes. All of a sudden, one day, it was just like, oh, Amazon affiliate marketing's turned off. Or, you know, I've, I don't know exactly what happened, but I saw lots of friends in Amazon affiliate say, uh oh. Well, and for me, and, and this hits really close to home because back in 2015, Bailey's Blossoms was predominantly on Etsy. We had our website, but we didn't know how to use it, we didn't know the power that was there. And so, of our sales were coming from the Etsy platform. And then in December of 2015, when I'm thinking life can't get any better than this, this is fantastic. I'm telling my husband he should quit his corporate career because I needed help with the six kids and everything else. And in the first two weeks of January, they pulled the plug and removed us from the platform. And I was devastated. I thought business was over. 85% of my sales gone overnight. And there was nothing I could do about it. 
And I walked out to the office and I went to go and tell my then eight and a half month pregnant customer service representative that we were no longer on this platform. And she looked at me and she said, Erin, are you telling me that after I have this baby, I'm not going to have a job? And I said, I mean, that was what I was going to, but when she put it that way, I couldn't. And I just looked at her and I said, no, I'm telling you that if you'll be patient with me, your job description just might change. And that was the pivotal moment where I knew something has to change. There's an opportunity here that I'm missing. And through that, we suddenly, we claimed the power of our brand. We revamped the way that we were doing our marketing. We grew 233% that year based off of these pivots that we made in a time of dire need where it would have been very easy for me to throw my hands up and say, too hard, too stressful, it's over. What worked yesterday no longer works today, so therefore we're done. And yet that wasn't the case at all. I've got to call an aside here for something that I'm noticing from the way you're talking, you seem to be super optimistic, super resilient. How much of your success with Bailey's Blossoms and Peyton Brie, would you say, is attributed to those qualities? Oh, I think that if there's one characteristic in successful entrepreneurs that I've seen, it has been the ability to not get so bogged down in the weeds, the day-to-day -day task list, the little, the things that kind of freak us out and stress us out to where we cannot get up above the road and see that big 500 foot or 5,000 foot level picture. And so it requires a degree of optimism where you're, where you can pause, keep your anxiety and your stress in check and look at opportunities that are right there as long as you don't get stuck. I want to call out a couple of other things here. Interesting things about the way you're thinking. I love what you said. Just a simple thing that you said about having a person that's working for you and being willing to tell them, okay, well, you're not going to lose your job, but your job description might change. And I think that for people who do employ other people, it's an interesting thing to consider that, you know, just because some part of the business stops working, you can't try to pull them into a different position and make them uh, right. do a different thing as part of, you're still a team. Uh, you've got a teammate still. And sometimes it even makes the team stronger now that everybody realizes they can have some resilience and shift and you know become something different. So also love that you're looking for opportunities when there's a problem. Also this sort of, I'm reading anti-fragile uh, right now by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. <laughs> and that's that kind of attitude. Okay, something hits me and actually makes me stronger. You also said, you know, you don't want to throw in the towel. I want to follow just, just this quick question. It's a little aside from our, our general process. I want to know, like, when do you want to throw in the towel? Like, actually, you decide, I need to throw in the towel on this or that as someone who's very resilient? That's a fantastic question. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I'm stubborn as <laughs> I'll get out. I mean, truly, but <laughs> the only time that I ever am going to throw in the towel is, for example, if I know that pressing forward in one direction is going to cause pain or friction in another priority that I have that I set above that direction, then I need to call it and say, this is not worth it. Because with every opportunity I advance in, I'm going to, there's a potential to, to possibly digress somewhere else. And if I'm not okay with what I'm losing over here or giving up, then we need to have a, a real conversation. I love it. And I think that's a great tip a lot of people face because they're told to keep pushing, right? But there are yes. also times when you shouldn't. And that's a great heuristic. Okay. Let me see how that you always got to give something away. And is the thing that I'm giving away conflicting with the, the higher level? Yes. With what I'm risking, if I lose completely, whether that's money, whether that's a relationship, whatever it is, worst case scenario, I completely lose it. Mm -hmm. Am I okay with that? And if the answer is yes, then that risk is worth taking. If the answer is, you know, heck to the no, I then it's reconsider, reconstruct, pivot, change, and look at the different opportunities. It sounds like that'd be a good blog post for you if it's not already up there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's come back to this idea. You mentioned, you teased us a little bit with these three facets. So can you dive into that a little bit? Absolutely. So there's three levers that I like to call. The first one is traffic. The second is conversion rate. And the third is average order value. So whether you're selling a product or a service, there's always going to be some type of a, an offering where you are making money. That's obviously the, the conduit and what makes your wheels turn in business. So the first one being traffic, there's ways to audit and understand both traffic conversion rate and order value. And it really just comes down to which lever am I pulling today? Do I understand how one affects the others? And do I understand how each of the cogs within each of those levers works to where I can manipulate them for the benefit of the business and the growth of the business? 
So first and foremost, if we're talking about traffic, let's assume for easy math purposes, you have a sales goal of $100,000 a month. Um, and your data shows that you've got a conversion rate of 2% and your average order value is 50 bucks. I mean, we're talking super simplistic math here, right? So that means that for every 100 people that come to your website, two people are gonna convert. They're each gonna spend 50 bucks, you're gonna make 100. So 100 people come to the website, uh, you get 100 bucks. 200 people come, 200 bucks. 1,000 people, 1,000 bucks, et cetera, et cetera. So then you know, that you need a hundred thousand people to come to your website in the course of any given month to be able to meet your sales goal of a hundred thousand dollar month so that's traffic now obviously the next question becomes okay well that's great Aaron but how do you get your traffic to be a hundred thousand people that's a lot of people right so first and foremost you have to know what you need so you have to understand what you currently have so it's auditing your social presence. How often am I posting? What types of content is working best? Test them against one another. A lot of people are throwing spaghetti at the wall and they, they're going, oh, some stuff sticks, but they don't even know what it is. So what we do is we say, okay, uh, for Bailey's Blossoms, we have a goal that says, if we're gonna post, we want 8% of our audience to see it organically without spending a dime. We just want 8%. So for ease of math, let's say it's 10%. So we have a 600,000 Facebook group, which means 60,000 people would see it organically. And then we would want 5,000 of those 60,000 to be able to engage with it, like, comment, share, whatever. And if it meets that criteria, then we're going to go over to a spreadsheet that we have that breaks down the buckets and it's going to say, okay, what type of content is this? Was this a video? Was it a live video? Was it a pr uploaded video? Was this a picture? Was it a grouping of pictures? And we're going to start tallying all of these things so that when we say, okay, what makes a post passable that meets the criteria that we're trying to drive towards? And then the more you collect this information, the more you can see these trends that say, wow, my customers, my audience, my, my community really responds to this type of content, this type of copy at this time of day. And so then you can start to really test um, how far you can push that and how you can optimize that content. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. It is a lot. We've been doing this for a while. You're, you're very quick with it. I think that that's really wonderful. And I, I'm imagining a listener at home just being like, whoa, fire hose. <laughs> um, but it's really great stuff. The idea is you have an agency here that helps other people develop their traffic and their sales. And so what I love about the way you're presenting it is, this sounds great from a sales perspective. I know when I'm trying to sell somebody something or even when I'm buying something, somebody has a system for me. You know, okay, we've got a spreadsheet. We're going to look at these different parameters. You know, we're going to rate it. We're going to take it in. Yes. I, I really love this stuff for an agency because you can sell people by saying, we've got this system. This is how it looks. Just come on in. We'll hold your yes. hand. So I like that aspect. <laughs> I, I want to jump in too. Yes. That's a lot of information that you shared, which is, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Thank you for diving into the numbers like this too. A uh, couple of things that jump out to me. How many people does it take to, to do this? Oh goodness. It was just me for so many years and only in the past year and a half, to two years have I really started to relinquish this to my team. There were certain things that I've owned, design being one of them, social media and marketing being another. And so really in the past two years have I really started to, and, and actually really in the past six to eight months have I actually really started to step out and say, Let's see what can happen if what, what happens if Aaron leaves for a month or two or three. Can we can you can I teach this? Can I these are principles that are very concrete. So it forced me to really um, write down and finalize these processes, which were living too much so up in my head. Right. And did you learn these principles by trial and error? Did you read a bunch of books? Oh, heavens no. Here's the thing. We get approached by advertising agencies all the time. And they're saying, oh, you're doing so great, but we want to elevate what you do. And then I'll say, awesome. Tell me your process. And they give me such a simplified breakdown. And if I start to share our process, they're like, whoa, that is so much more than what we offer. And because of that, I've just seen how many people are not really thinking about this as a multi multifaceted opportunity. And it's like looking at a, at a singular object rather than something that's 3D. One more tangible question before we, we move on. Before you handed it off, you're super busy, you have six kids, you've got the entire other rest of the business to run. How much time per week did you spend doing the marketing? Oh, goodness. We're looking at probably 15 to 20 hours a week. 
So, and that was because I was also doing all the data pulling and everything too. So there's the data side and the strategy side, and then there's obviously the tangible, we're posting, we're engaging with the customer, all of that as well. Cool. So traffic, that's, uh, do we get through traffic enough to... I'll touch on just two other things really quickly. We talked about auditing your social presence, but there's also what areas do you own? And that's email and SMS lists and testing those things as well. And then there's what's your organic reach strategy. So I know for us, we've tested this enough to know that there's three things that gets people to traffic over to your website. You're shouting about something new, you're shouting about something on sale, or you're shouting about something that's trending. And so if, if you're focusing on that my biggest question when i'm when i'm mentoring people okay hey, what is your what are you trying to accomplish and they'll go oh i don't know okay let's start at the basics what is the point oh we just want to make money awesome okay money's great let's get a little bit more specific new sale trending let's start there what are you pushing what's the message that you're pushing out what's the call to action and then let's back into it so all of those things it's just about the more clear that you are about what you're driving then all of a sudden your marketing your seasonal marketing plan that you put together I know for us we say okay we're expecting we're gonna have a sale here sale meaning promotion sale over here sale over here so in the dips of that there's peaks and valleys right so in the valleys of the sales promotions were going to offset with a peak in a new item release or a trending item announcement to try to level out the top line sales as much as possible. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's also something I'm noticing. I mean, you can probably speak to this more than my, what my intuition is, but like with clothing brands or fashion brands, that's kind of the model I'll see, or even other things I might buy online, like vitamins or, or supplements or something. It's kind of like, when's the sale? You know, what's the featured item? Kind of, what are we talking yes. about right now? And then there's other brands where it's kind of like, let's just keep giving you information. Let's teach you things. Let's, you know, give you knowledge. Yes. Is that, am I sensing that, that that's kind of the way that that, that kind of e-commerce, especially fashion, works more. It's more about the sales Absolutely. and the trends and less about the information marketing. And ultimately, when it comes to information marketing, that's going to be more around your healthcare, more around different situational opportunities and like coaching, for example. The when I put out when I put out content for my coaching, I'm not talking about, hey, get this promotionary hundred dollars off your next hour session or the yeah. other. Cool. Thanks for that. I think it'd be good yeah. here to to call out for the listener the context in which they can use this information that you're sharing because it is coming in like a fire hose. Ethan had mentioned <laughs> it, but you can take to the listener, you can take this framework that Aaron is outlining and some actionable ways that you can use it if you don't have your own business are to approach a friend, offer to implement a system like this uh, for free for the first month. And after that, you can start seeing some results and you can say, charge a nominal fee. This is something that you can do in your spare time. If you're working from home, right. help out a friend, improve their business and, and practice in a lower stakes way. So that's just one avenue in which you can take the ideas that Aaron is sharing, take this framework and turn it into your own business. I think that in a lot of our other episodes, we've talked about different frameworks like that. And you're sharing such good information about the strategy in itself that I, I like the time that we're spending on it. Back to you. you. You're laying out the game plan. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, second lever obviously is going to be your conversion rate. And a lot of people say, okay, well, how does conversion rate affect? Well, let's say that it's a $5,000 goal. If you increase your conversion rate by only half a percent to, from 2% to 2.5% and your average order value remains the same at $50, you would only need 4,000 people to come to your site to reach your goal instead of that 5,000 people. So what happens is you simplify the, your need for traffic by increasing your conversion rate. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, people send me a, their, their URL and say, Aaron, do you think my site is pretty? Do you think it looks good? And I'm saying, oh honey, wrong question. The question is, is your site performing? What is your conversion rate? What is your average order value? So I don't really care if it's pretty or not, if it's working. It could be the most beautiful site in the world and you sell nothing, or I've seen terribly ugly sites, per my opinion, that are selling incredible. I've got to cut you off again there. I'm going to just hip the audience to this a little bit. We're, we're doing the interview. We were getting started. And we, we think her background, we're, nobody's going to see this video probably, but we think your background looks awesome. It's like a atelier, kind of like a shop with some fabrics <laughs> tossed around. You're like, oh, I got to clean it up. Everything visual is, it's got to be perfect. You know, 
What's that like for someone who's very visual, aesthetic design conscious to make those compromises when you're putting together a website? Or do you just say, you know what, it's all about the conversion. I don't care what it looks like. It's really about the conversion. How do you mix those two things when you're putting that together? Great question, especially because we are fashion driven. We can never be unaware of the aesthetic. So it has to be on brand aesthetic, but I, I drive with data. So for example, we're going to do a site audit. And when you're looking at your homepage, you know, 90% of consumers right now are utilizing their mobile device. So if you open up your website on your mobile device and you look at the first thing that people see, all the banners, all the products that they see before they scroll. So it's above the fold is that section that before they scroll and so it has the potential to that's your prime real estate so if you know so for us of course we're fashion so if I'm gonna go into my reports and I'm gonna say what is my highest converting category of products now I know for us it's jumpsuits and rompers it's just what we do we do it very well and so jumpsuits and rompers is going to be one of the top banners on our website during specific seasons. Now it may change in the summer, it may become swimwear or whatever else, but we know that based off of the number of pieces that are selling in any given category or collection, that that is the stuff that we want to showcase first. Too many people are trying to drive forward with the one product that's been sitting on the shelf for five years and they can't get rid of it. Don't lead with the crap. You want to lead with the best of the best of the best. And if anything, maybe somebody will tack on the crap at the end, but they're not going to check out because they have crap in their cart. They want the best that you have to offer. So now you're going to not only just take that category of goods, but then you're going to break that down further and say, okay, I know that jumpsuits and rompers is my best selling um, category, but I offer 50 jumpsuits and rompers. I'm not going to put a picture of the lowest selling piece that I have in that collection on the banner. I'm going to put a picture of the, the top or the one of the top three items on that collection because I know that's what people want and that's what's going to drive people to convert. So it really just becomes this balance of yes on brand aesthetics but drive it with data you don't need to guess what people want if you have data your data will tell you what people want and you got to listen to that more than your personal opinion of what looks good and so then you're going to create that banner with the best-selling item in the best-selling collection and you're going to put that first and then the next one's going to be the next second best etc etc right. Yes. right yeah and it's like and you, there could be just a, a lovely article that you know is just beautiful, but if nobody's buying it, you don't put it at the top just to like make nope. other people like it. You can like it if you want, but it's really, you got to respond yes. to what other people enjoy. Absolutely. And then of course, the third, the third lever is going to be your average order value. And we actually have put together a formula that my team can play around with and say, okay, we're planning on this. We're seeing this trend, uh, plug in one number, see how the other numbers adjust in order to meet that goal on any given day. So the way that you can do this is very basic. You're cross selling, you're upselling, offering free shipping, but not just free shipping. You look at your average order value and you incentivize them to purchase 20 to 30% more. So if your average order value is 50 bucks, then you say, okay, $60 or more or 65 or more uh, gets free shipping so that it's a win for them and a win for you. And you're not just giving away money to be nice. The nugget section of our, of our uh, notes is going to be huge. <laughs> <with this. laughs> so, I, I wanted to ask you, okay, so we talked about those three things. We talked about traffic, conversions, average order value. Do you, do you focus on each one, one month at a time? Are you pulling the levers all at the same time? I mean, how do you keep a focus when you have all of these things to manage? So each of these cases is driven by a different type of behavior. So for example, new arrivals produce a higher value, a higher cart value. So that increases the average order, but it may not have quite a high conversion or it may not have quite a high conversion rate because it's not on sale versus a massive blowout closeout sale is going to drive a ton of traffic, but the average order value is going to go down because the, the value of the items has decreased. And then you've got your trending, which is going to be kind of the mix of both, you know, so there's different consumer behaviors react to different levers in those different ways. So it just becomes a, an, a general understanding of this is what I'm offering. This is how I know that consumer behavior is going to affect these, each of these three levers. So therefore, this is how my goal needs to, needs to shake out in order for me to reach what I'm trying, what I'm pining for. I want to get into a, a, the tactical steps here a little bit more. You talked about the importance of traffic conversions, order value. Do you think about that on a channel basis as well? So I'm picturing a listener at home who 
finds this all overwhelming and they uh, typically people right. will start out by saying, <laughs> I'll help you on Facebook or I'll help you with your SEO. Or, I'll help you with your Google ads. Um, yes. How do you think about the different channels and when it comes to your framework that you mentioned? So going back to my Etsy story, I am a huge proponent of having a website that is your own, that is your home base and utilizing the social media platforms that you show up on as the vehicles to drive to your home, not as your home itself. Anytime that you consider your Facebook platform, your business or your TikTok, your business, and you don't have a URL or your own website to, as your home base, you are incredibly liable to being shut down tomorrow if anything goes wrong. And so for me, those are all traffic drivers. They're vehicles, but they're not homes. And you can't own a house that's built on someone else's land. And so when I'm looking and evaluating this data, I'm looking and evaluating off of the website performance, not off of any other third-party platform that is not mine. So when you look through the quality of traffic that's driven by those different platforms, are you seeing a significant difference between uh, the platforms? And would you recommend Absolutely. a a platform for business owners to start with or, or a listener to start with if they are trying to help an e-commerce company? So uh, understanding the differences in each platform is vital based off of who your target audience is. So for example, one of our brands, Bailey's Blossoms, is very heavily Facebook, but starting to become more Instagram as our older moms start to age out. And now we're getting this newer generation, which is more Instagram and starting to become a little bit of TikTok too. So it's just, it's understanding where your audience is and where you need to show up to meet them where they're at, because they're not just going to pop over to Facebook if they don't have a Facebook account, just because you're on there and they like you, you need to go to Instagram if that's where they are or YouTube or wherever it happens to be. So it really has, it's less about one platform trumps them all than as it is what kind of people are on that platform and what is their generalized behavior and who are you trying did to Did you target? throw a lot against the wall and see what stuck to figure that out? Or did you uh, have an idea in some other way? We test like crazy. We're always testing. A new platform shows up. We test there too. We, we want to constantly be aware of the trends, but really the biggest piece of advice that I have is that in every case that we've seen astronomical growth, we have taken a poll or taken a temperature on the people in our ecosystem that are there right then. I think so often business owners are, are overly consumed with getting more people into their ecosystem that they forget that they already have people there and they're not asking them, hey, what do you want to see? Where do you want to see us show up? What products do you want to see next? And as they start to feed you that information and you value their input, now all of a sudden they become a part of your brand story and they drive you. You've already got them there. That's how you create loyalty amongst the customers to where they say, wait, I'm a valued part of this experience. They, they're asking me, they value my input, they're hearing me, they're implementing Implementing, and then you end up growing together. And that's been a huge part of our story. So if a listener wants to start an agency around these, these kind of topics, they're getting a lot of information to get a strong foundation. They're going to have to do some testing themselves to establish it. Having those systems and building those systems and editing those systems along the way are going to be really powerful. What do you think is the value that they can offer a client. So if, if, if somebody going to sign up with an agency like this, how much do you think that the client could expect to pay that agency? Oh goodness. I'll tell you, it depends on the agency, but I have had people pitch to me anywhere from eight to 18% of sales or eight to 18% of ad spend, or, I mean, there's so many different ways. Um, so it's, there's a huge opportunity there based off of the expertise and the knowledge of the people who set up the agency. But like we've mentioned before in this, this is just not something that anyone's doing right now. If somebody were to go, would start the agency, would you recommend they aim for the higher kind of revenue brands to start or should they start low and then work their way up? Have any thoughts on getting started with an agency like this? You know, obviously um, the larger brands have a lot of clout. They have a lot of connections. And if something goes awry, I'd rather, I'd rather fall on a smaller stage than on a big one. And so for me, if I was just starting out and I didn't already have the experience that I have, I would probably start small and grow into it. 
Last thing you want is for someone to give you a hundred thousand dollar budget and you blow it. <laughs> so, I mean, it, testing it out with a thousand dollar budget or five and starting to get your, your sea legs about you to where you can speak to this as fluidly and with confidence. Cause I think the biggest thing is if you're going to pitch to somebody, experienced business owners and larger businesses and corporations are going to ask the tough questions. They're going to know the questions to ask Inexperienced business owners don't know the questions. They just, they're desperate for help. And so it becomes a, a balance of make sure that you're matching your experience with the experience of the business so as you grow. And then as you get bigger and more established, then you can attack those bigger and more established businesses because it will get harder as it gets bigger. And let's say one of your kids, you know, they're getting old enough to start their own business. They just said they want to run with this kind of an agency model and, and implement this. Who would you tell them to be their first client? My biggest thing is if you want to learn it, do it and, and literally do it. If you want to know what it's like to grow an e-commerce business, start an e-commerce business and then you learn it and then you can teach it. But if you've never done it before, no one's going to listen. But I mean, nobody's doing it. So if somebody were to say, here's this case study, the case study is what I've been able to accomplish. And this is what we're now offering to other business owners. Well, now you've got instant trust. Talking about it without any experience, having tested it out on yourself first, is it's risky business for everybody involved. So the shortcut though, is to find maybe someone like yourself who's good at this stuff and kind of build off the fact that they've built the knowledge and reputation, but you're only sort of consulting with them a little bit. You're not asking them to run the whole business, getting a lot of input from them, how to make it work. And that's where our podcast comes in. And if we have an ambitious listener, maybe they can reach out to you <laughs> <laughs> and start this business and you could be, you know, like a mentor or some type of a guidance. Absolutely. Well, we're uh, coming up on time here. I've got to uh, task you because you seem to have it all put together. And I'm curious, what are you thinking personally as a, a growth opportunity for either yourself or the system that you've just described? So, I mean, I'll be honest, I absolutely love teaching. I don't know if it's the mother in me or just all the fun experience that, I, that we've been able to have the blessing to glean over the years. But I love teaching entrepreneurs. I love teaching would-be business owners. I love, I love all of it. And so right now, one of my things, obviously, I have the Conquering Chaos podcast, which I do. Um, and I'm in the middle of writing a book, which I'm hoping to, that I can get done if my kids ever go back to school. Who knows? <laughs> but there's a lot of different projects for me that are more personal in nature that I'm working on because it fuels my fire. And that's, that teaching and coaching is one of them. Awesome. So one question that I'd like to leave our listeners with, what's one thing that you want them to take away from the conversation? If you were to, to wrap it up, put a pin on it for the listener. Honestly, if I could go back and give myself a little bit of advice in the beginning, I wasted so much time thinking that I wasn't capable of learning the hard things. Ultimately, you see these roadblocks in your path and it's enough for you to go, wow, you know what? This isn't worth it. I don't know how to get over this or around it or whatever it happens to be. Therefore, I'm just going to give up. I didn't ever got a college degree. I never got mentored or schooled for any of this. This has all been the school of hard knocks and real life experience. If I can do it, I know it sounds cliche, but if I can figure this out, truly you can figure this out. It is a, if you have a passion and love for what you do, here's what I've noticed. There are two things that stop us. Either one, it's a mindset or two, it's a skill. And if you're lacking a mindset, then you can change your mindset. If you're lacking a skill, you can learn it. Either way, you have within the power to be able to get over that roadblock. If it's a skill, learn it. If it's a mindset, change it. Either way, the power is yours. Have you said that before? Because that sounded really good the way you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Aaron. I know I'm pumped up. I, it's Friday afternoon here, but you make me want to go like run a marathon or start, you know, start a couple of businesses. <laughs> I'm ready for a nap. I got tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to the listener who is also feeling amped up, not feeling like taking a nap, then take some action, follow through on some of the uh, steps that we've talked about here on this episode. Email us, tell us what you've done. Email update at runwithit.fm. Everyone who responds will get access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one lucky listener will earn a free mentoring session from Aaron and a potential business partnership. Aaron loves mentoring and, and prove <laughs> that you can walk the talk, then uh, maybe you can impress her. 
Aaron, thank you so much again. Where can people go to learn more about uh, Bailey's Blossoms and Payton Brie? Bailey'sBlossoms.com is also found on on Facebook and Instagram. We hang out there pretty frequently. Peyton Brie, PeytonBree.com, Facebook and Instagram. I also do, I show up and do some trainings and coachings on Facebook and Instagram as Aaron E. Hooley and AaronEHooley.com. And then of course, there's the Conquering Chaos podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Looking forward to hearing the listeners take action on this and and, uh, we'll update you afterward. Awesome. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Now it's time for you to run with it. Follow through on the action steps discussed and email a summary of what you did to update at runwithit.fm. Every listener who emails us will gain exclusive access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one listener will earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Help us build the Run With It community of generous entrepreneurs. Please like, subscribe, and review us online. And remember, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. 